Today's scripture lesson is from Ephesians, second chapter, verses 4 through 10. Listen now for the word of God. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomprehensible riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you've been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, It is a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So last week, last week I interpreted Paul's letter to the Ephesians as saying, God has a plan. It's a plan that we cannot thwart. It's a plan that God set into motion before the world began. And Paul assures the Ephesians that that they were chosen to be holy and blameless before God. Now it's important to understand that being holy and blameless wasn't the end goal in God's plan we are intended to be holy and blameless but we are intended to be holy and blameless for a purpose okay we can't forget that for a purpose part okay because if we do if we forget that that we're to be holy and blameless for a purpose then then we risk sliding into this kind of universal salvation which which maintains that God loves us so much that we can do whatever we want, whenever we want, or even nothing at all, and it doesn't really matter because God's love is overwhelming. Without that for a purpose, we treat unconditional love as a kind of unconditional acceptance. We insinuate that even if we don't say it, we insinuate that that God and others must take me as I am and leave me be. And thus, nothing really matters. Not our belief, not our behavior, not our good, not our evil. I'm fine the way I am. In fact, however, God's love is unconditional. But without a response to that love, there's ultimately no purpose, no benefit, no worth garnered from it. And God's love becomes indifferent to how we live our lives. At least to us it does. It's there, but who really cares? What Paul actually says to the church in Ephesus and to you and me is that God chose us in Jesus Christ before creation began to be holy and blameless in God's sight to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Paul assures the Ephesians, as we too are assured, that there is honor in being chosen, but we must also remember that we are chosen for a purpose. There's work to do. That that purpose, when embraced, transforms our lives as believers. We as believers in Jesus Christ are equipped for holiness, for the task of bringing unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And and it's through this great gift of the Holy Spirit that makes that all possible. And so so who we are and what we do does matter. Now, now the gift of the Holy Spirit, it, it comes with a caveat. That, that nothing in our lives can be withheld from God's observation or from God's intervention. One cannot be touched by the Spirit of God and not be transformed. It's not possible. 
indifference doesn't mesh with the Almighty. Moses was, was touched by God and his face shone and, and, and he led the Israelites out of slavery into the land flowing with milk and honey. Paul was, was touched by God and, and, and though he was blinded for a time, once the scales fell from his eyes, it's reported that he spread the gospel to the Gentiles throughout the known world. The disciples were, were touched by God and, and fear fled from their souls and, and they became the voice of God calling people to Christ. When we forget that we are chosen for a purpose, we are dead in our transgressions and sin. Dead in our transgressions and sin is another way of saying that we are indifferent to the ways and to the will of God. In practice, Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls that cheap grace. We claim holiness and blamelessness as stars in our crown while we reject the pursuit of the purpose for which we've been chosen, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And, and without that pursuit of unity, we're left chasing holiness. And that path brings glory, but not to God. It brings glory to self. Look at me. Look at how faithful I am. Look at how obedient I am. Look at how blameless I am. Look at how holy I am. Look at how wonderful I am. Don't you want to be like me? Such attention to self leaves us gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. It leaves us dead in our transgressions and sin. Paul tells Timothy, though it has the form of godliness, it denies God's power. And, and we find ourselves deserving God's wrath. In, in real life, I'd be watching out because I know that somewhere along the line, I'm going to get my comeuppance. I, I'm going to get what I deserve. And, and so I, I lose all sense of that assurance. I lose all sense of comfort and consolation in Christ and, and I end up constantly looking over my shoulder for that divine retribution that has to be coming my way because I know I ain't perfect. But because of God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. Paul tells us it is by grace that you and I have been saved. It is by grace that you and I have been saved through faith. And this is not of our own accord, he tells us. It's a gift of God. Not works so that no one can boast. By grace, we don't have to constantly be looking over our shoulder fearful of divine retribution. Being holy and blameless is not the source of our salvation. It never was, and it never will be. Being holy and blameless is a gift provided by the Holy Spirit for a purpose. Paul says we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now look at that language. Okay? We are God's handiwork. Think about what Paul's really saying here. We are God's handiwork. Not our own. The, the language that we use today of, of self-help, of self-made, of self-sufficient, it, it encourages us to think in terms of controlling our own destiny, of, of creating what we live for. But the language of Scripture brings us back from the edge of that cliff to remind us that God has a plan. God is working to complete the plan within you and me. His divine plan of perfection. And God does that through Jesus Christ, who equips us to do the good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. 
Now, the good works that God intended us to do are, are manifest through lives of holiness. They, they serve a single purpose, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now, here's what's really cool about all that, okay? Here's what's really cool. When we discover Jesus, we discover our purpose. When we discover Jesus, we discover our gifts and graces. When we discover Jesus, we discover the obstacles on the path that we need to overcome if we're going to be holy and blameless before God. When we discover Jesus, we are able to embrace and complete the good works God intends for us to complete so that we will be active participants in building the kingdom of God rather than obstacles for others. When we discover Jesus, we discover the gift of the Holy Spirit. We discover that we are alive in Jesus Christ. I mean really alive. I mean the, the we embrace nothing can bring me down kind of life. We, we discover the, the to live is Christ and to die is gain kind of living. And, and how cool is that? Now, before you go hog wild with happiness on that, ponder this. The only command that Paul gives the Ephesians in, in this second chapter, the only command he gives them is to remember. Paul wants the Ephesians, really you and me as well, to remember that we, where we were before we had a relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants us to remember the disdain with which we were held by believers. Paul wants the Gentiles to remember that when the Jews called them uncircumcised, it wasn't a complimentary descriptor. It was a slur. Paul wants the Ephesians to remember that they weren't always where they were at the writing of his letter. He, he wanted them to remember that, that, that there was a time when they were separate from Christ. There was a time when they were excluded when they were not recipients of the covenant promise. Paul wants the Ephesians to remember what it was like to live without hope, without God in the world, without Christ in their lives. Because for us to forget where we came from, from the depth of darkness and despair, from, from being dead in our transgressions, Man, that's to forget that someone somewhere extended a hand of salvation and brought us home by the blood of Jesus. The, the good work of another revealed Jesus Christ in me and to me. And just like that, the kingdom of God was one person closer to the unity of all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. I was accepted despite being in a different place in my spiritual journey. And, and because of that acceptance, I came to understand that I too was chosen for good works. I too was chosen to participate and to complete my part of the divine plan. I too was saved by grace, not by works, so that neither I nor anyone else could boast. Granted, I had obstacles to overcome. Before I truly came alive in Christ, I, I lived in the moment. I, I, I did what I wanted to do. I, I focused on, on the feel good. I jockeyed for acceptance by those I wanted as friends. I made decisions based on, on how popular or how unpopular I imagined them making on whether I thought my parents would find out or not find out, okay? I, I did all kinds of dumb stuff because it seemed like it would get me to happiness. Praise God, I didn't have to get my life in order before I was welcomed. I was gifted with a grace that allowed me to discover the divine. 
And slowly but surely, the obstacles in my life were overcome through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit and through the good work of others under the guidance of Christ. I came to peace in my life. A, a peace that is fully dependent upon the fulfillment of faith provided by Jesus, who destroyed the barriers that were separating me from the source of salvation. Jesus had broken down the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside his flesh, in his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations. Because of what Jesus did for me, and I might add for you, I joyfully strive to live my life for Christ. I joyfully strive not to think more highly of myself than I ought to think. I, I joyfully yearn to do the good work of bringing unity to all un, uh, in, in heaven and on earth under Christ. And it's a journey. This is the good work God intended for me from the beginning. This is my opportunity to participate in building the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. The question is, that's mine. What good work is God nudging you to do? What good work is God nudging you to do? Paul says that Jesus preached peace to those who were far away from God and peace to those who were near to God. Remember what Jesus said? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. We have access to the Father by the one Spirit. And consequently, we're no longer outsiders. We are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. Adopted, predestined, to be members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In Christ, our obstacles have been overcome. They're still there, but they don't have the power over us. And so let's extend the hand of holiness to allow others the freedom and the space to join us in embracing God's grace to overcome the obstacles that they are facing. In Jesus, we are all joined together and we rise to become a holy temple in the Lord. That's what Paul tells us in the second chapter. So let's remember our roots we who were dead in our transgression and sin are now alive in Christ Jesus. And together we are being built, being built, not doing the building, we are being built to become the dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. So let's remember God's amazing grace. Because it's only by God's amazing grace that holiness happens. It's only by God's amazing grace that unity in heaven and on earth under Christ is possible. It's only by God's amazing grace that our chains are gone, that we've been set free from sin and death. It's only by God's amazing grace that we can celebrate salvation. It's only by God's amazing grace that we can share that salvation with others. And you know what? God's amazing grace is enough. Amen? Amen. Will you stand?